Bajah Qaida Subsi has given a speech which, uh, uh, in which he, um, he, spoke about, he uh, spoke about the events, but also accused some foreign elements of uh, maybe fomenting those uh, uh, protests in Kasrin. So the, the, the mood is quite electric and uh, very nervous. You can see that people uh, the, the, did not... Um, uh, uh, th th their, their reaction to, to, to the events were, were more, more or less violent across the country. In Tunis, things were calmer, although there were a few, um, a f a few clashes around some neighborhoods like Tadamun and Nihla. But this morning, things uh, are back to normal, I guess, in Kasrin, but also in other areas that have seen uh, clashes since last week over the... Uh, uh, the um, uh, over uh, an employment, uh, unemploy uh, unemployment um, uh, protest um, following the death of uh, uh, a young Tunisian un undergraduate in okay. Kasrin. Okay, so um, there is expected to be... Um, no, go ahead. Yes. Yes, there is expected to be a demonstration in uh, Avenue Bourguiba today. Um, we're not sure when it's going to take place, but, um, uh, but generally speaking, uh, people are... Uh, the, the mood is not going to go uh, to become calm in the n in just today because uh, things are still uh, simmering. Um, okay, so th things uh, are still very tense. With regards to uh, what's going on in the country, in general speaking. Right, looking in from Istanbul, uh, Monica Marks, um, have the events in, in, uh, in Kasserine taken you by surprise? No, not at all. This was entirely expected. Many of the grievances that we're seeing protesters uh, espouse were at the very heart of the revolution in 2011. And even in protests that predated the revolution in Gafsa and the southern mining regions of Tunisia in 2008. So this was entirely predictable and in many ways as a function of the failure of Tunisia's political class to begin to address some of those core socioeconomic grievances that sparked the revolution to begin with. And as it stands, can you see the situation spiraling, it, it, its momentum spreading? Do you think history is indeed repeating itself? What we're seeing parallels the Tunisian revolution uh, in, in many ways. Some of these protests have similar uh, grievances, similar origin points. Um, but, but the fundamental difference is that we don't have a dictatorship in Tunisia at the moment. Uh, we do have a democratically elected government and quite a bit more freedom of expression in Tunisia. So um, the, the conditions are quite different, but it's, it's also very difficult to predict in which direction this could go. The government's response uh, has been ham-handed at times. The government promised that it would create 5,000 new public jobs in the governorate of Gasserine in a desperate attempt to quell the protests. Uh, and then the next day, a government spokesperson stepped out and said that was a communication error. So uh, one could envision a scenario in which um, ham-handed handling by the government would contribute to more spiraling of these events. Yeah, it does seem to have been a somewhat confused response. Uh, Roxanne, in London, uh, Tunisia was, of course, portrayed as a, as a great success story, but under the surface, it seems to be very different. Well, on one hand, it certainly is a success story in that it does have a, a, a government that is in power, that has been elected, and it has a new constitution. And I think that it is perhaps uh, to be considered that setting up a democracy is not as easy as perhaps it was thought at the time of the Tunisian Revolution. And in many ways, the driving force, the eco economy, which underscored so much of the uprisings at that time, has not really been addressed. It has been the political aspects that have taken uh, the first uh, pass. And so, in many ways, now the economy is coming back uh, to haunt those that are in power, and uh, they have got to now act to solve this underlying problem, which is uh, not a factor of democracy, it is a factor of the economy of the country. Okay, we'll come on to the economy in a minute, but when uh, the President talks about, and the Prime Minister indeed, talk about uh, the outside elements, uh, i.e. ISIL, uh, are fomenting trouble here, Roxanne. Uh, what, what's your take on that? To what degree do you think that's a true uh, interpretation of what's going on? Oh, I think that's very real. Since the revolution, one of the things that has plagued Tunisia has been uh, a great deal of terrorism, which was never 
uh, that much part of the Tunisian uh, experience, and it has certainly affected the government uh, and the people enormously. It has uh, destroyed tourism, uh, for example, and the shooting of Seuss and in the, uh, on the beaches of Seuss and in the Museum uh, of Bardo and uh, really undercut one of the major sources uh, of uh, Tunisian income. It is clear that those that have uh, referred to dirty hands or incitement by extremists of the uh, activism that's going on right now in the streets comes from this real fear that there are uh, extremist elements that are seeding the demonstrations and that are going to turn them into something that they're uh, not originally having started from. Monica Marx, is that something that you concur with, that, that uh, ISIL is inflaming this situation? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important that we understand uh, Tunisia's economic woes in part uh, through the framework of an economy under attack by terrorists. Part of ISIS's strategy in many different countries, including Turkey, has been to ex exacerbate pre-existing domestic problems. And one of the biggest pre-existing problems in Tunisia is this tension between underdeveloped interior regions, which are quite a bit poorer than the coastal areas, um, and problems of unemployment, etc. So by attacking the economy, ISIS has really been able to do a lot of damage. But at the same time, this is not entirely um, a product of, of ISIS and ISIS's attacks on the economy. ISIS is inflaming the situation, but if you look at a lot of human development indicators in Gasserin, it's been behind uh, Tunis. There's been this gap between the interior and the developed coast for a long time. Illiteracy is about 20% higher in Gasserin. Unemployment is about 10% higher. Um, drinkable water is 40% less available in Gasserin than it is in Tunis. So we're, we're also seeing um, these long simmering socioeconomic inequalities that just have not been addressed by governments before or after the revolution boiling over. Okay, Roxanne, thanks very much indeed. Uh, let's uh, just move on to the economy, uh, as Roxanne was referring to just now. As we've been saying, this latest string of protests is largely fueled by youth unemployment. And bear in mind that the figures I'm about to show you are estimates from the International Labour Organization back in 2014. It has actually got worse since then, but let's have a look at them anyway. In Tunisia, more than 40% of young people are unemployed. In neighbouring Libya, one in four of all young people is out of work. In Egypt, almost 40% of those between the ages uh, 15 and 24 do not have jobs. And in Iraq and in Jordan, it's about one in three. And these numbers are indicative of a general problem in the Middle East and North Africa, of course, where youth unemployment averages almost 30%, which looks considerably worse when you compare it to the global average of 13%. So, Huda, as far as Tunisia is concerned, uh, to what degree do you sense uh, the people out on the streets are, um, I find it difficult uh, because of the lack of work that's around uh, and, and they're upset and, and it co creates this, this atmosphere of tension and uh, angst against the government. This anger that we have seen in the last, uh, in last, since last week has been simmering since the elections in 2014 of the current government led by Nidal Tunis. The problem is that the government has been quite weak in dealing with some pressing challenges, including uh, pressing up for certain projects that have been stalling since um, uh, the Troika government led by Islamist Nahda. Added to this, the infighting within Nida Tunis and the disintegration of the, of the party between uh, um, Abedjik Al-Sibsi's son uh, and uh, Mohsen Marzouk on uh, uh, camp. And, all of these political problems uh, made young people think that uh, this government is not serious enough to tackle the issue of unemployment, but also uh, given um, work, working on an economic reforms. Um, unfortunately, you cannot stop young people from uh, becoming angry and getting angry at the not only at the inaction of the government, but also the institution of uh, emergency and uh, last night of curfew uh, uh, on, on, on nationwide curfew made things even worse. Um, okay, okay, well, let's, let's just focus just right now on the, on the economy uh, for a moment. Sorry, Monica, if I can come to you, uh, 
given the pressures on the economy that there are with the terrorism attacks and so forth and, and the fact that it was in a pretty parlous state anyway, uh, can we blame the government for the position that the, the country is now in or should the economy be in a better state right now? Well, I think there are huge economic challenges that no interim transitional government is going to be able to address easily. That having been said, there are many different steps uh, the government could have taken to, to help the situation that the government hasn't taken. What Huda was saying about Tunisians criticizing the, the, for, uh, the ruling party, Nidat Tunis, which recently disintegrated, she has a lot of good points. Many Tunisians look at this government and think that they're asleep at the wheel because they've been spending more time on internecine clan conflicts, on infighting, than on really paying hard attention to some of the legislative changes and behavioral changes that, that Tunisia needs to adopt to move forward economically. And just quickly, a few of those changes are a very heavy bureaucracy. It's very difficult to start a business in Tunisia. Um, difficult for young people especially to get access to credit, to, to financial tools. Um, a lot of corruption. Tunisia has done pretty much nothing to address corruption, which has been uh, spreading uh, since the revolution. It's been democratizing and diffusing uh, in many ways. There's no anti-corruption commission. A lot of the young people that we've seen protesting on the streets have complained that in order to get a job, they actually have to pay a local official 2,000 or 3,000 dinars as a bribe, and that a lot of these public jobs are not being given in a meritocrat uh, meritocratic way, but that they're very corrupt. So the problems of uh, youth unemployment are also tied to political indecision and political lassitude in terms of moving forward on issues like streamlining the bureaucracy, uh, like tackling corruption, like uh, creating a clearer investment code, legislative framework to stimulate growth. And Roxanne, I think it was the president who said you can't tell people who are hungry to be patient, but, but in a sense it's exactly what the prime minister has said this afternoon in his press conference saying that solving Tunisia's problems uh, is going to take time and it's going to take five or ten years as we've already been discussing. And indeed, the Tunisians feel they've been very patient because uh, I would argue that the previous government uh, under uh, Anata also didn't seem to have the mechanisms and instruments to hand to really address some of the uh, economic woes. And it, uh, the most recent government has not been able to address a key element, for example, uh, which is the, uh, the, the terms w with the mines in Gafsa in uh, the south where the phosphate is mined and is a major source of both employment and uh, export for Tunisia and the uh, relationship with the government and the terms of uh, how that mine has operated have not been working well. So I would agree with Monica, there are some structural problems that are very difficult to address, but the inefficiency and the lack of focus on the part of not just this government, but previous governments has been quite severe. Perhaps the only one that seems to have done quite uh, a bit better was under Mehdi Jomai. He was the uh, technocratic governor, uh, government that uh, took part uh, for a while between Nida Tunis and the first major uh, free elections. Um, that seemed to be the only one that was able to allay some of the uh, concerns of the population, but nonetheless they feel as though they've been very patient and that things have deteriorated. There are over 700,000 people in Tunisia out of work at the moment, and over 60 percent of those with graduate degrees are out of work. So there's a great sense also that the resources, the young and the educated resources of the country are simply not being used in order to get the, uh, the economy back on track. And I think one of the frustrations also has been that in many ways the outside world has expressed such pleasure that Tunisia has been able to be that uh, spotlight on the, uh, in the Arab world of starting a democracy without really putting their money where their mouth is and saying we are going to support the economy and uh, the needs of this country in order to be sure to uh, start off the economy on the right foot. And so for five uh, years it has in some ways languished and only now uh, is uh, France, for example, stepping up and saying we have got to start supporting Tunisia and 
and uh, help them with development in the South and with youth unemployment. Right, yeah, yeah. France uh, uh, prepared to put forward a 1 billion euros over five years, I believe. Uh, Huda, I'm going to come to you in a second, but Monica, if I can just come, come to you on what Roxanne was just talking about, and as far as the economy is concerned, the inefficiency of the economy, if you like, because it still favors the old elite, doesn't it, in many ways, and that would be a deep source of frustration for unemployed youth on the street. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Ro Roxanne made a lot of good points. Um, there are deep-seated structural inequalities, lack of development in the interior versus the coasts, uh, et cetera, a lot of widespread corruption, heavy bureaucracy. Um, a lot of people say that this is in part a problem of the legislative framework, but it's also a problem of mindset, uh, habits accumulated over decades of, of dictatorship that served a select uh, cronyistic few. So, so these problems are going to take a lot of time uh, to address, that's for sure. Um, tough love will be, will be needed. Uh, honest conversations are important between the government and the citizenry. What we've seen a lot of governments do, with perhaps the exception of the Mehdi Joma government that Roxanne was mentioning, is promise uh, kind of, in a kind of desperate palliative attempt to, to take the edge off social unrest, promise an expansion of public sector jobs. The problem is Tunisia's public sector already is responsible for the creation of over 65% of jobs in Tunisia. It's very bloated. The state can't afford to keep creating new jobs. Uh, we need to create a situation in Tunisia with, of course, lots of international help um, that is much more conducive to, to small and medium-sized enterprises and a lot less corrupt, a lot clearer. And Huda, coming full circle to where we started, uh, right now, do you think the government uh, has a grasp of the seriousness of the situation, how much discontent there is on the streets? I mean, you, were, you talked about how, how tense the atmosphere is still. Do you think that the curfews will resolve this situation, that things will settle down and people will uh, just have to be patient, as the Prime Minister said today, or do you think this could yet continue? I think the imposition of curfew might reduce attentions for a bit, especially uh, with uh, uh, accounts of uh, looting and vandalism from uh, some criminals, which makes sense that the government has instituted the curfew. But in the long term, I don't think the crisis will be diffused because, um, the, I mean, those people who were protesting were doing that in a peaceful way. Just this morning, I was watching something on my Facebook uh, uh, regarding uh, with young people from Kasrin were who were um, volunteering to clean the streets after the clashes, which shows some readiness from those people to um, protest in a civilized way. But, but it's very hard balance for this government to try and uh, respond to those pressing uh, needs and not giving them unrealistic, giving young people unrealistic uh, promises of giving 600,000 jobs or uh, in 2016, as uh, the current Minister of uh, Commerce, Sam Hassan Hassan, has promised um, uh, a couple of days ago. So let's wait and see how things will work in the next few days, because it's very hard you know, to, to gauge the reaction of people, uh, especially in the current uh, events at the border, uh, at the border with the Algeria and Libya, where some of those, uh, you know, some radical elements, including ISIL, are, 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 going, uh, are wanting to take advantage of, of, uh, of the chaos that they see in the country and capitalize on it. Uh, but uh, I personally think that um, more communication from the current government um, with young people, especially the, the, young, uh, uh, the, uh, the young graduates in those regions, will be m more efficient, at least in the short term, to try and find a uh, solution to this uh, deep crisis. Okay, thank you very much to our guests, Huda Zude, Monica Marx, and Roxanne Farman Farmanian. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on the uh, programs page of our website, aljazeera.com, and you can post your views on facebook.com forward slash 